and the Patient Choice Award recipient since 2008. Uh, just a great guy besides that. I have fun with him whenever we get together, which is not that often, but it's yeah. just fun to talk to him. So in any event, Dr. Condemi. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you everybody for uh, allowing me to speak today. And uh, actually, this is my first time speaking to a large group uh, in terms of uh, carcinoid. Uh, but since many of you here are my patients, you've probably heard a lot of this in the office before. Uh, I guess this time you can't complain that you had to wait for me, though. <laughs> so I'm actually speaking on time. I kept my appointment today. Um, <clears throat> my journey in terms of carcinoid care started uh, early in my training, I had a couple patients during residency and internship and uh, during fellowship, of course, and I had the good fortune to meet Dr. Warner uh, when I was a second year resident in Inglewood and then again uh, later on in Montefiore. And that's actually where I met Dr. Fine for the first time. So I've been learning from these fellows for quite a while. Um, and when I became an attending seven and a half years ago, Dr. Warner had a patient in Jersey that he asked my group to take care of, and one of my former senior partners asked him if, I, if he could give the patient to his uh, new associate. And Dr. Warner said, as long as he does his good job, it's okay with me. Uh, and uh, I guess we did a good enough job because he still speaks to me and uh, is uh, kind enough to share patience with me and uh, teach me every time we, uh, we interact. Uh, for those of you that have, well, in fact, now everybody's at my Holy Name office, so uh, that's my office up there. And this is literally my office. We have a nice window space and some good sun when we're not freezing in the winter time. <laughs> now, the talk is going to be a little bit different than uh, what the other speakers went over today. What I wanted to do is to call together some of the questions you folks have asked in the office. And Jim was kind enough to provide a list of questions that come up at the monthly meetings in terms of what focus, what happens to you folks, what you folks have to go through, and hopefully I can answer some of these questions today. Uh, some of the main questions, why are we undiagnosed? Why are we misdiagnosed? And as many of us know, uh, the time from initial symptoms to which treatment is best for me as an individual? And a lot of times, the main question, especially when we start talking about chemotherapy, well, doc, is this going to help me? Can I benefit from this, or am I just going to suffer from the chemotherapy? And there's a lot of stigma attached with that, uh, and it's understandable, so we have to spend a lot of time talking about that particular issue. Um, then again, do the treatments themselves work? And as Dr. Fine was uh, just going over, some of these treatments can work exceptionally well. And do I have to live differently? What do I have to change in my life? And of course, a big question for a lot of people is what alternative treatments are available? We see all kinds of TV ads. We see things on the internet, in the newspaper. Uh, there's a big push of nutraceuticals. So we all have to deal with this question of, well, I read this, my friend told me that. And it's actually quite a bit of my day is spent talking about this, not just in regard to carcinoid cancer. So how do people come up with carcinoid? Well, a lot of patients who had diarrhea, who had flushing. Um, how many doctors did you see that said, oh, you know, it's menopause, it's this, it's that, you, you're lactose intolerant. And you know what? These aren't necessarily wrong answers. I mean, these things happen the majority of time to the majority of people. And one of the things that happens to us as physicians as we grow up from a college student in med school and then in internship and residency is to not look for the zebras, to look for the, you know, hoofbeats of horses. In fact, uh, at least in my training, and I know for a lot of other doctors, you were scolded for thinking about the zebras. You know, you could always throw syphilis at the bottom of your list. You could always throw a little this or that down there. And, you know, if you mentioned carcinoid about 55 things down from the top, you want to get yelled at. But if a patient came in with these symptoms and you said carcinoid, you'd be scolded by your attendings. 
So we were actually trained not to think about this kind of thing, but you have to, because the reality is a lot of people have these problems. And one of the things that I've learned you know, in being an oncologist is you have a few different kinds of doctors. The majority of doctors generally wind up taking care of pretty healthy people. Yeah, you, know, you have hypercholesteremia, you have hypertension, you have maybe a little bit of diabetes. But when you get these esoteric problems, I kind of guess you need an esoteric doctor to take care of them. And you have a few of us over here. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but I think now, as education is becoming better, we're making the diagnosis earlier. And this has to do with the medical students being trained to look at these things more. Certainly the access to information is easier than years ago. Every doctor nowadays has access to up-to-date or 16 other resources, not just on their computer, but heck, on the phone, that you can look up something in two minutes and uh, put it on your differential diagnosis and let me look at this, let me get a chromin granin A or something else. <clears throat> and we also have better diagnostic tests than years ago. Uh, MRIs are much better, they can pick up smaller tumors, the CT scans are better, give us better res uh, resolution, and uh, because of our interventional radiology colleagues, now we can get biopsy things that years ago we couldn't biopsy as easily, and we can actually see it under the microscope. Should we be treated? Well, absolutely, everybody should be treated. Treatment does not mean that you have to get chemotherapy. Treatment does not mean that you necessarily have to have statin. Treatment means that you have to be cared for. And we, that means we as physicians have to pay attention to your symptoms and deal with that. So our job isn't to make cancer go away. In fact, most of the time we can't do that. We'd like to control it, but we need to control your symptoms. We need to make you live better. And that's ultimately the job of what I do all day long. And that's what I tell my patients. I'm not your cancer doctor. My job is to be here as your advisor in terms of your health. How can you live better? How can you stand up straighter, walk with less pain, make sure you go to the bathroom the right way without having to go 15 times a day? And even sometimes in that fashion, <clears throat> okay, you're going 15 times a day. How do we make that better? Okay, let's buy Charmin, not this, not that. Sometimes it's silly things. But those of you in this room that are my patients know that we often pull a lot of tricks out of the hat in terms of how to make the day go a little bit better. And it's always important to match the treatment to the patient. So when we have somebody with bad diabetes, do I want to treat them with oxaliplatin in the, forms, in the course of treating their colon cancer or treating their carcinoid? Not necessarily, because this is a patient that generally comes to me with a neuropathy and we have to make sure to balance the side effects of the treatment with what the patient already has. And like Dr. Fine was saying, you want synergy from the chemotherapy agents? Well, you want synergy in terms of what the patient has and what you don't want to give them. And going along the way, we also have to make sure not to burn bridges. There are certain chemotherapy agents that work well in one sequence but don't work well in the other because we might have too much myelotoxicity, too much toxicity to the bone marrow. As Dr. Fine was mentioning about the platelets, something we always worry about in terms of knocking out the counts. We want to make sure that you live well again, not that you wind up <clears throat> bleeding or bruising and so forth. And the treatments have to be multifactorial. Sometimes we use our surgeons, sometimes we use our interventional radiologists, sometimes we use chemotherapy, oftentimes you're using all three. And, um, <clears throat> in process of what we're doing now at Holy Name Hospital is actually bring together enough people that are interested in carcinoid care, simply by virtue of now having some volume there, that everybody's willing to spend some time to learn about it. And we recently recruited an endocrinologist who has been the most difficult specialist to get to pay attention to carcinoid. So which tre treatment is best for any particular patient? As we learned throughout the day, it depends on the presentation, the particular type of tumor, what symptoms are being displayed, other health issues, and the side effect profiles of the treatment. And sometimes we have to use these treatments in combination. 
and dose reduce here or maybe dose escalate there based on what we can get away with with, with that particular patient. And that's the most critical point of all this care. If somebody wants to eat a good meal, you don't wind up generally going to McDonald's. You want to go to a nice restaurant, somebody that's going to make a meal for you. Treatment regimens for all of our patients, no matter what cancer, has to be specified to the patient. And that means you have to have enough experience to be able to dose adjust and move things around to, for that patient to be tolerated and get through the treatment well. Can the treatments help? In general, yes. But the treatment, again, involves the entire spectrum of what we can do for the patient with regard to their health situation, not just the chemotherapy. And the treatment has to encompass all types of symptoms, be it the flushing, the diarrhea, pain, fatigue, uh, what the blood counts are doing. Uh, for our patients that present with pulmonary carcinoid, it's much different than our patients that have uh, rectal carcinoid. So we have different things to take into consideration. Treatment means management. And a lot of time I spend with my patients is talking specifically about that. Well, doctor, am I going to cure my cancer? Well, always we want to affect the cure. Is that possible a lot of the time? Un unfortunately, no. But we don't have to cure it. I have yet to have a patient that I've cured of diabetes. Most patients aren't cured of hypercholesteremia. We don't often cure hypertension. And certainly, Obesity is something that we're working on all the time. <laughs> Some more than others. Uh, the idea is to manage it. As long as we keep things under control, we get stable disease is good by me, and I think by most of us in the room, we're happy with that. Of course, we're more excited when we see things shrink. But as long as we can manage things, live well, and ultimately in the framework of an oncologist's mind, if I keep my patient living long enough that they wind up in the far, far future, dying of a heart attack, I did my job well. Make sure that cancer doesn't become the main issue of your life. And what I tell a lot of my patients, all of you, is you know, if we don't try to get a response, we're not going to get one. Even though these are slow-growing tumors, they will grow. Um, when we have patients that come to us with a small cell lung cancer, or diffuse large B cell lymphoma, or last night when I had an acute leukemic come in, it's a different kind of situation. The patient I met last night said, hello, I'm Dr. Demi, you have this problem, we have to start chemotherapy right now. Because those patients, unfortunately, won't be around until next week. Now, what happens there, because you have a, a liquid tumor that grows so quickly, you can affect treatment because those cells are growing rapidly. In some of our other cases, like small cell lymphomas, they grow so slowly, it kind of becomes like a carcinoid case. Because all the trials that have looked at this have yet, over the past 30 years, to really come up with a significant increase in curing that disease. In fact, the reality is we don't cure it. Because those cells grow so slowly, we can't get to them. We have the situation here that we have slow-growing cells. We have to get to them a different way. And by attacking from different areas, we can hopefully get there. How do the treatments work? Well, a lot of different types of treatment. Uh, we're going to have a nice uh, talk in a little while about surgery and how those interventions can help. Uh, certainly, I am of the opinion, and most of us are, if we can have a tumor sitting in a mason jar or in a plastic bottle with formalin in it in a pathology department, that's exactly the best place for cancer to be, sitting on a shelf, not sitting in a person's body. <clears throat> and the more often we can do that, the happier we are. Um, in many tumor types, and you, know, you folks have heard me say other tumor types so far, you know, with the relative paucity of carcinoid care or carcinoid cases that have literature on it, we have to extrapolate. So we look at breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Just in those three cancers, you're talking 650,000 cases a year. So there's a lot of data. Well, when we look at breast cancer, we look at renal cell carcinoma, we have good evidence that if you take out the primary tumor, even in metastatic disease, the metastatic disease slows down. So extrapolating this, the more tumor we can get rid of, the happier I am. 
Of course, we have to balance this out with how do you get rid of the tumor? What sort of procedure do you use? Is it surgical? And if it's surgical, what's the toxicity or morbidity of the surgery going to be? We have a number of oral medications that we use nowadays. There's load and temdar that Dr. Fine was talking about. Pills. Everybody loves taking a pill versus getting a needle. This I can say with certainty. Nobody comes into the office asking to get an IV. Uh, but of course we have our intravenous medications. And the way we do things nowadays is much, much different than years ago. Um, how many patients come in now in their 70s, 60s, that remember their mom or their dad getting chemotherapy 30 years ago? And they're completely terrified at the idea of getting chemotherapy. Why? Mom started throwing up the moment she walked in the infusion center. Dad would sit down and they'd give him a bucket to vomit into when he started getting his chemo. Um, nowadays, we know how to give the medications better. The way we give cisplatin, the way we give all of our agents actually is so much more different. And the supportive medications that we have are worlds better than what was available even 15 years ago. So nowadays, it's, it's actually very rare for patients to get sick on chemotherapy. And you know, sometimes the first cycle or two, we have to work out a couple of the bugs, change the dose a little bit, give different supportive medication, and we get through it. It's exceptionally rare nowadays um, to have to admit somebody to the hospital from toxicity from chemotherapy. Of course, we're always careful about it. We monitor our patients closely. So nowadays, uh, the biggest pain in the neck is showing up to get your blood counts all the time and to be checked, which you know, might be an inconvenience, but it's a lot better than being sick. We have uh, radiation therapy available to our patients. It's something that we haven't touched on too much in terms of external beam radiation therapy, but with uh, the growing acknowledgement of the disease, we have more and more patients that have bony disease and our radiation oncology colleagues are very helpful in this regard, be it through the use of directed beam, uh, external beam radiation, or the use of <clears throat> quadrament and strontium if we have diffuse disease in the bone. And then, of course, our interventional radiology colleagues uh, that do so much of the work, at least in my practice, um, in terms of helping our patients, for starting from diagnosis and then going on to treatment. In fact, when I started at Holy Name Hospital, a new interventional radiologist was starting there at the same time. Um, I'm sure you know John Runback, Dr. Sullivan. And I told him that I was going to become his best friend. And uh, lo and behold, two years later, he said, boy, Giuseppe, you really were right. <laughs> because I sent most of the work to his group. Uh, you know, it's really brought us forward in terms of how we can care for our patients in a much more manageable and less morbid fashion. Uh, and just getting back to the surgery, can it be resected? Well, if uh, do you have somebody that knows what they're doing with these particular tumors? Do you have an anesthesiologist that's experienced with these tumors? Uh, unfortunately, we don't all have Dr. Pommier available to us to uh, uh, take these things out. But uh, uh, and you're, if you haven't heard him before, wait till you see his picture. So he's great. Um, but the idea is to have a team approach, medical oncologist, cardiologist, if you need endocrinology, surgery, interventional radiology. Um, I've even, we have a, a carcinoid specific dietitian, nutritionist uh, coming through as well to help all of our patients. We have to take care of every aspect of life we can take care of because the more things we take care of, the better we make life. With regard to oral medications, we have chemo and non-chemo. The non-chemo stuff really comes down to the supportive medications we have with regard to anti-nausea, uh, anti-diarrheals, um, and we go through a whole bunch of different things. In fact, this is the majority of the visit, isn't it? Talking about symptoms. How do we take care of the flushing? What do we do for the diarrhea? I have pain, I have this, I have that. And a lot of different medications that we use to help support things. And of course, our chemotherapy agents that are now mostly oral. And falling under chemotherapy, but really not chemotherapy, are our biologic agents, such as Sutent and Affinitor. 
um, that our targeted therapies, they're working in a different fashion and they're much, much more tolerable. In terms of intravenous medications, uh, again, the supportive treatments, IV fluids, antiemetics for our patients that have bone disease. Uh, we have a number of medications now available to treat bony metastases, and these help treat not only pain, but they help prevent, in many cases, the recurrence and progression of disease in the bone. Not that we have data for this in carcinoid, but we have data in other malignancies that demonstrate this. And again, with chemotherapy, a lot of time is spent dealing with the stigma of chemotherapy. And the funny thing is that the people that come in most afraid of getting chemo, once they get chemo and they feel good with it, they're the biggest proponents of it. They can't believe that they're getting chemotherapy and they're not sick. It, to the extent that they ask me if we put water in the bag and if we put the medicine in there. Now, how does chemotherapy work? Dr. Fine was going over some slides before, but really is, it's an exceptionally complex series of events that needs to take place that, despite being complex, is simple because we have to do one thing. We have to stop this DNA replication in the cancer cell from taking place. Our DNA is wound up as you can see here. I think there's a pointer here someplace. No, okay, there you go. Um, it has to unwind and then it duplicates on these other sides here. So this is what we don't want to take place in cancer and we use a number of different medications to affect that. You can deprive it of its food supply. You can insert, if I can find it again, there we go, different medications along the way to stop the binding, stop the unwinding, stop the winding, and this helps us come along. When we have other molecules, this is a nice easy slide, right? we got to spend a few hours on this one. Now let me find my cursor again. Now over here we have this little guy called the mTOR. Well, we have this medicine over here called the virulimus with finitor. This block's here. But if you look at all these arrows and all these lines and our little transmembrane <coughs> binding sites here, these are all areas that we look at to affect care, to stop the cell from growing, to inhibit cancer cells from replicating. Uh, a lot of different drugs here. This is bevacizumab, which is called Avastin. And in the field of colon cancers, literally a miracle drug. We took uh, what was an average nine to 12 month survival and extended it out to years in metastatic colon cancer. Um, <clears throat> in the middle here, cetuximab, you know, a drug that is Everybody loves because it works so well, unless you happen to be Martha Stewart, because that's why she got in trouble for this drug. Uh, then we have uh, Herceptin, Vectabix, drugs here that block the human epithelial growth factor, the human epithelial receptor here, in terms of growth factor, and all these things that help in downstream. <clears throat> Again, going to apoptosis, we want that cell to die. We want to decrease the rate of transcription. We want to decrease the rate of angiogenesis. All these different mechanisms to help decrease the tumor burden. And a lot of these drugs are more specific than years ago. Because they're more specific, they work on the cells that are causing the problem and have, in general, less side effect. We had a very nice talk earlier about interventional radiology and the different things our friends can do there, uh, be it from biopsy, the radiofrequency ablation, chemoembolization, our yttrium 90. Um, a couple other things that aren't carcinoid specific, but are something that we wind up using in our carcinoid patients all the time. Um, typhoplasty for patients that have bony disease to the spine that have perhaps caused pressure, pain, spinal, uh, <clears throat> spinal cord compression and then stenting in terms of various types of stenting. If we have obstructing tumors in the bile duct or if we have retroperitoneal disease that's obstructing ureters, we 
stent all day long, or at least I send patients for stenting all day long. Do I have to live differently, doctor? How is this going to affect my life? Well, the first thing you have to do is to get you to live better. You know, if we can get rid of flushing, that's better. If we can get you from 12 bowel movements a day down to two, that's better. If we get you to stop losing weight, better. If we can get you to, in certain situations, gain weight, better. And uh, we spend a lot of time working about this. <clears throat> My joke to most of my patients is the only thing you're not allowed to do is kickboxing and uh, bungee jumping. Um, so we want you to live an active, normal life. How do we affect that? Well, let's see what we have to do for that particular patient. Um, is the patient a dancing instructor? Well, we have to make sure she can dance. Um, we have to make sure that our patients are able to you know, the funny thing is, I figure when I'm doing my job the right way, my patients go on vacation more often than me. So um, <laughs> I have to live vicariously through them. Uh, but if that's the case, I think I'm doing my job the right way. We have to focus always on living. What are the things that we can do in life that are pleasurable? Well, make sure that there's no nausea and vomiting. So you can go out and have a nice meal and enjoy it. Make sure that, you know, we take care of the back pain sufficiently well that you can sit down and see a movie or you go see a show in Manhattan. Take a car ride that's more than 15 minutes long without having pain. Uh, relatively simple things, but important things, as long as we can manage them. Um, usually we don't have to change the diet too much. And those of you that come to my office know that the, I'm the last doctor that a cardiologist wants to talk to because I'm always pushing the protein, the fat, and some cholesterol, but in the setting of taking care of cancer, the body has to do different things. We need building blocks to make good cells. We need cholesterol, we, okay, within limits. Um, but we need these things to help produce the cells that repair the body. Uh, wine is good. This much wine. <laughs> um, so, you know, the other docs call on occasion, but uh, Usually we give them some of the same food and the same wine and they acquiesce and uh, come around. <laughs> um, another concern with our patients on treatment. You know, can I go out? Do I have to worry about taking a bus? Can I go on the subway? Um, nowadays it's uncommon to drop the blood counts that the immune system is very exposed. So generally we can do these things. Of course we have to be careful and every situation is uh, unique. But in general we do these things. And yes, you can have some salt, not too much salt. And uh, we try and make sure that everybody has a good time, but uh, that we don't cause problems as well. <clears throat> alternative treatments. How many people in this room have read about alternative treatments? The rest of you are lying. You didn't put your uh -huh. hands up. <laughs> right? Because we all have. And it's natural. You know, we see all kinds of commercials on TV. We see ads all over the place. And unfortunately, we have, at least in my opinion, we have a, a nutraceutical industry that can say a lot of things that they shouldn't be allowed to say because they have no data to back it up. And when you have a vulnerable population, these people are going to listen to different things. And it makes sense. Um, it's hard to overcome the prior stigma of chemo. Sometimes it's very hard to overcome the knowledge that you have a nasty disease. Dr. Fine deals with patients that pancreatic cancer all day long. These people are sick. And every one of these patients, and every one of you folks just about that comes in is scared. And it's understandable. So we have to spend a lot of time educating ourselves and educating all of you. What do we mean by educating ourselves? Well, we read, we have to read our journals, but we also have to read all that other stuff out there too. So probably a quarter of my reading is spent reading non-scientific material because it hasn't been a true randomized controlled trial that we all like to see. You know, even we talk about retrospective trials, well, we don't like it as much as the other kind, but it's the best we got. 
these other things aren't trials at all. It's just anecdotal. Now, sometime anecdot sometimes anecdotes help. Uh, treating breast cancer patients, we have uh, probably a thousand women right now on aromatase inhibitors. Now, these drugs are known to have the potential to cause arthritic type joint pain. What do we do? We give them glucosamine. It helps. How do we find out? It wasn't a randomized controlled trial. It was a whole bunch of women that took these things to, on their own, and it worked. So we brought it out. We give Nulasta to a lot of patients that are on aggressive chemotherapy. Nulasta can hurt. It stimulates the bone marrow to make a whole bunch of white cells. That sometimes can cause a lot of bony pain. How do we treat it? With Zyrtec, Claritin, and Advil. This was not a randomized controlled trial, but so much anecdote that we actually learned that it helped. So we have to take benefit from wherever we can find it, but sometimes you have to take with a grain of salt and understand where it fits in for your particular patient and how we can put things together to bring benefit. Um, a lot of times people are looking for natural cures. They're skeptical of the system. Well, Doc, you know, there's a cure out there for cancer, but the drug companies are making too much money to make that drug and cure cancer. Trust me, if there were a cure for all the cancers, a company would want to sell that drug because they wouldn't have to worry about making money anymore. We might be out of business, but the drug companies wouldn't be. So we have to understand the impetus to read these things from the patient's perspective. Truthfully, most of the time I'm speaking to the family in this regard because the family members and friends wind up doing most of the research uh, and knowing where it is so we can answer the questions appropriately. And where does flaxseed oil fit in with this? Where does the cottage cheese cancer cure come in? Um, there have been a lot of things, and I'm sure my colleagues can share a bunch of interesting stories about all the stuff we've heard. But I think we should always listen to it respectfully. Uh, if we don't know the answer, look it up and give honest answers. And uh, sometimes in the course of this, you know, we wind up learning a little something in terms of what can help. But there are other alternative therapies that I think work very, very well. I send a lot of patients to physical therapy, uh, especially patients that have uh, bony disease. Um, <clears throat> anything that can help improve mobility, stamina, and decrease pain is good as far as I'm concerned. Uh, massage therapy, acupuncture, I send a lot of patients for it. In fact, at both of my hospitals, we have massage therapy uh, available. In Holy Name, we have massage there. We made a deal with the massage school in the town next door, and they come to the infusion center two days a week. And they offer massages, free massages, to all the patients uh, because it's very beneficial. At the very least, you worry less about waiting for me to show up on time um, <laughs> while, while you're there. Uh, we. Uh, Oh, you see, I have the cottage cheese treatment. That one's stuck in my mind for a few years now. <laughs> Unfortunately, the fellow that recommended this for his mother now has cancer, and he doesn't want cottage cheese. He wants chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> and as we mentioned, the nutraceuticals and the, how some of them can do a very good job, like glucosamine. Um, but we have to take into consideration whatever data we have on other drugs and where it works and where it doesn't work. For instance, vitamin E and beta carotene. We have very large trials in lung cancer that demonstrated that these were bad things to give. Not just it didn't help, bad. So unless something is really studied, we don't know what it's going to do. How many physicians, when the beta carotene study was put together, or the vitamin E study was put together, thought that it would actually have a negative impact? Almost none. You wouldn't think it, but lo and behold, they did worse. So unless we study something rigorously, we really don't know. And we have to be careful in this regard. And uh, in closing, I'd just like to thank all of you for two things. For one, letting me take care of you. 
and two, for stimulating my mind so I can learn more to help all of you. Thank you, Dr. Kinnemi.